Hello and welcome to this month's edition of Slugger TV. In this episode, we're going to be doing a review of the year. We were inundated with requests after our in-person year-end review to do a TV version, so we have acquiesced and done one uh, for you for this Christmas season. And to go through what was a momentous year in local politics, we have the Belfast Telegraph's crime and security correspondent, Alison Morse. We have the Irish News political correspondent, John Manley, and the political reporter of Belfast Live, Brendan Hughes. Guys, you're all very, very welcome. I'm going to start with you, Alison. Biggest political moment of 2022. Now this feels a bit like a school reunion, doesn't it? <laughs> you, know, you two, I yeah, definitely have met you two before. Um, you're all formerly of the Irish yeah, News yeah. as well, I should say. <laughs> I think that the biggest political story was definitely the, the meltdown that went on within the Tory party and Liz Truss's dramatic exit as leader that we know that was you know extended by what about 10 or 11 days because of the death of the Queen should have been out the door quicker had it not been for that but the fact that you know that they burned through so many leaders so quickly and also the impact that all of that had on here because all of that rang within the Tory party Remember, the local political parties were right in the middle of that. You know, they helped move Theresa May out of her post. They helped get Boris Johnson. He proceeded to shaft them. All of that came from that sort of confidence and supply deal and everything that fell fell in place after that. So watching that unfold, I mean, we all watched those leadership debates in the, the run-up to the, the leadership election and everything that Liz Truss said, you know, people were saying this is economically illiterate. You know, this is going to bankrupt the country. And yet they still, still voted for her. Um, albeit she lasted even longer, like shorter than Edwin Poots even managed to last as leader of the DUP. So yeah, I think that was the big story in the terms of the impact it's had on us all because the, the entire economy crashed in her short tenure in 10 Downing Street. Yeah, 30 billion pounds in 40 odd days. That's not, uh, that's not bad going. John, what about for you? What was the biggest political moment of 20? Well, and, you know, we are obviously spoilt for choice. Alison's named the obvious one, you know, and even uh, Liz Truss's, you know, 47 days, whatever it was, could be described as a moment. It was so short. But I'm going to go for something that uh, was maybe not as significant, but to me it was significant, and that would be Jeffrey Donaldson apologising for claiming that the Southern Trust had held up important cardiac surgery because of delays caused by the protocol. Now, I say that, and then subsequently he also said that he'd been apologised to by the Trust, which he's been able to unable to corroborate since, or the Trust, and the trust hasn't been able to substantiate that. So it really all feeds into just the, the misinformation that has got us into the current situation that we're in because, you know, the DUP has made all these sort of uh, claims about the protocol and its economic impact, and most of them have been found to be exaggerated or completely false. So I, that's what I'm going with that because I think that just may be a turning point. Okay, Brendan, what for you has been the biggest moment of 2022 politically wise? Well, just when Alison mentioned about Liz Truss and that Tory meltdown, I suppose my thought was which Tory meltdown is the one that is the biggest moment of 2022? Because obviously before the Liz Truss fiasco, we had the fiasco surrounding Boris Johnson. And I think for me, that really was the biggest moment because Boris Johnson going into 2022, obviously he had the controversy over Partygate and he had various different controversies building up. But in the years before that, he had you know a big Conservative Party man date uh, you know you would have thought that his leadership was unassailable at a point but clearly he wasted that opportunity there were many occasions in which really he lost the faith of his party because simply he dealt with crises after crises in the wrong way and that led up to that really extraordinary scenes extraordinary scenes really in the uh, Downing Street whenever you saw that so many of his um, faithful so many of his cabinet members were resigning and him um, holed up in Downing Street trying to cling on to power, trying to see if he could um, manage to put together a cabinet. I think that that was quite significant. And also, um, you know, seeing that play out in Twitter, you know, obviously Twitter's getting a lot of flack these days because of um, Elon Musk. But I think whenever you see some of the power
authorities and the way that people have um, dealt with these sorts of moments, it really adds a bit of level, levity to the situation. I, I recall in particular whenever people decided to put the outgoing music to EastEnders, you know, the theme that they usually use whenever someone dies, and they put that as um, over the top of the footage of Boris Johnson leaving um, Downing Street in you know, his black motorcade, and then the, the camera pans up to the sunlight as it um, closes out on that on that music. So <laughs> moments like that, I think, are just, it, it's almost beyond parody. These sorts of things we never thought we would see happen, and yet they've played out this year. He treated it like it was um, Ferris Bueller's day off for about the last like, two months. He said, you know, I am going to wait until there's a new leader elected, and then proceeded to drive around in tanks and get on as if it was basically like a, a Jolly Boy stag weekend for the rest of the time he was there. He was in a fighter jet as well, don't yeah, forget that. Uh, don't forget that too. And the interesting thing was, again, you're right, hard to believe Boris Johnson started the year ahead in the polls. Remember 2021, yeah. Keir Starmer was under pressure. The Tories had won a by-election from Labour. Um, and again, just how much uh, um, uh, things changed. For me, the moment of 2022, I think, was after the death of Queen Elizabeth and that huge moment that the British establishment had been working toward for a decade. Um, not working toward, that's the wrong language, but, but have been working out how to deal with the fallout of for a decade. And when King Charles comes here and meets Michelle O'Neill and Geoffrey Donaldson and the party leaders here, and I just thought, forget about the assembly election, yeah. I thought the real shift to Michelle O'Neill being the senior lead politician here, I think happened in that moment where King Charles in Hillsborough Castle shook her hand and said, oh, you're the, you're the leader of the largest party, aren't you? And I just thought that, if anything just symbolised the change that happened on May the 5th, I just thought it was that. Just quick comment on that, John. What did you make of, of that moment as well, that big sy symbolic moment? Again, it hasn't happened for 70 years, and you, Mara, coming in, and then the impact of, of that with Michelle O'Neill. Oh, certainly. And I think that, you know, uh, Sinn Féin uh, did well in that whole in situation. And, you know, it could have been a time when, you know, people were, were so uh, willing to take offence, you know, and there was some justifiable grief at the time. Uh, and I think the Shinners played exceptionally well. Uh, as you say, they had great, you know, unbelievable symbolism, because that was in many ways the sort of first public appearance of the, 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 the uh, First Minister designate and potentially the Deputy First Minister designate. Okay. What did we learn about local politics? Obviously, we had an assembly election this year, so it's always good. An assembly election always tells us, well, it tells us about our political attitude, certainly of those who voted anyway in the election. And I just wonder, what did we learn about local politics this year? So obviously it's hard to cast your mind back, it's been such a full year. We had the Poots Post decision. We then had the resignation of Paul Given shortly after that. We had the rush of private members legislation. We then had the election. Uh, we had Tweetgate with Doug Beattie as well. We had the SDLP falling down the eight seats. And um, we've had oh, a number of secretaries of state. Alison, what for you, what are you... What are you taking uh, for, uh, that we learned about local politics in 2020? I think in the, the run up to that election, you know, there was numerous opinion polls and the DUP looked like they were in serious trouble. I think that one of the things that we've learned from those opinion polls is that regardless of what they say about Jim Allister, he's never getting anybody else elected with him. He's staying on his own. But it shows, I suppose, that no matter how far we go on, and remember you next year is the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, no matter how far we've progressed, when things happen, like the protocol, like a crisis, uh, a crisis like that, people do still vote in terms of those old-fashioned, sort of tribally voting, because the DUP were managed to bring their vote back up, almost, you know, to a point where it didn't look like it was even possible at one stage. It looked like they were going to lose numerous seats. The next time, if there is another election, they'll take those votes back off, mm -hmm. off Jim Allister, and we can see that that's going to happen. But what, what we know now is that we are literally a three-party a three party state, you know, with Sinn Féin, the DUP, and the Alliance, and that's going to continue, I would imagine, mm -hmm. for many years, almost in a similar way as it we see in the South. You know that 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 has now become, rather than the two, you know, the two big civil war parties, you now have a three a three party, you know, um, political arena down there. I think it's going to be very similar up here for the foreseeable future. And people keep saying that Alliance bounce has plateaued; it's 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 flattened out. But every time we have an election, they seem to be able to manage to make more gains, albeit not at the expense of either the DUP or Sinn Féin albeit at the expense of the Ulster Unionists, and now it looks like also at the expense of the SDLP as well, and of the Green Party, who were completely wiped out. They lost both their, both their seats, which was really disappointing, given the fact that they punched well above their weight in time, terms of their time in the Assembly. Both Rachel and Claire had managed to introduce really important and significant mm -hmm. private members' bills. Um, 
and it was it was disappointing to see them go but that middle ground now is clearly just aligned behind the alliance there's no room for for anyone else yeah uh, Bren, what about you what what did what did you take from local politics this year what did we learn well firstly before talking about lo local politics i think just to touch on liz truss again i think the the thing that i took from politics generally is that really we none of us should have any self-doubt because if liz truss can rise to the top to become <laughs> prime minister then really we are all capable of anything so i think that I, that's really what i took from 2022. She also lived through more monarchs than any other prime minister <laughs> she managed to go through two monarchs in, in her short 44 days or whatever it was absolutely historic tenure <laughs> And I think that if we were to take anything from that meltdown of the Tory party, then it's, you know, that we're all capable of anything. And, you know, we really shouldn't hold ourselves back in also that regard. Also, the Prime Minister to be appointed, travelling by plane as well. There's a fun fact for you. So there you go. Another, so another, to Scotland today. There you go. another David McCann fun <laughs> fact. <laughs> but local politics, get back on the talking point. <laughs> well, look, I, I think Alison's right in terms of the trajectory that we're now seeing. I think that a lot of people thought that in the assembly election that happened in May, that really that trajectory would have taken a bit of time to to bear out really that it would have been a couple of election cycles before we saw what we saw in May but really that has um, come come around really much more quickly that we now have effectively this three-party state between Sinn Féin the DUP and Alliance Party and there really isn't any room at this stage for you know any other middle ground parties and you know if there had been an election in December I think that we would have seen those um, those three parties strengthen their positions I don't think that we would have seen any of the other parties try and um, gain ground in that regard and we may see that play out again whenever we have the um, local government elections later this year and indeed potentially another assembly election as well so really you know we're going to see that play out particularly if there is no new executive put in place anytime soon I think that for Sinn Féin in particular you know this is really the trajectory that is the only way is up really if there is no um, executive mm -hmm. formed simply I think that more nationalists in particular will rally in behind um, Sinn Féin um, at this moment in time and really for those smaller parties, really they will be looking to see that there is an executive put in place at some point um, in the near future so that they can, I suppose, try and scrutinise what the executive parties are doing. And But without an assembly, then there really is no room for that. Yeah. Two elections in one year, don't but you have to accept was, a comment it twice? Was, it's still for a the sore. like of you, for nerds like you, it's, two elections in one year? It's still a sore point. Thing December, December 15th will always be a dark day for me. Yeah, uh, no, you were morning The road day. not taken. Um, <laughs> Uh, that was the biggest travesty for me with Liz Truss going, the change of <laughs> prime minister. We, we didn't get the second election. Um, uh, John, for you, what did we learn about local politics? Well, I, I think we learned more that our politics is broken and that our, as a result, our public services are broken. Um, now, there's a couple of reasons for that. I think that, that, that just the, the pressure of Brexit has created that and the fact that we're, you know, hitched to the, the British or English Brexit experiment, and there's very few ways to, to relieve ourselves from that. You know, I don't, you know, potentially a uh, United Ireland's the answer, but that's not going to happen in the short to medium term. Uh, I think that we, what we're seeing is the DUP moving from its the status that it's had over the last maybe decade, decade and a half, where it's been the establishment unionist party, and now it's, it's returning to being the party of protest and being outside the system and sniping. There's this, you know, the, the, the the people saying that Geoffrey won't serve alongside Michelle O'Neill as, as Deputy First Minister. But I think it, it's even bigger than that. The, the DUP has found, you know, that it, it's been legislated above its heads with Irish language legislation and with uh, abortion legislation. And there's, there's just there's nothing it can stop anymore it seems and it doesn't have the power in the assembly so i think they're they're sort of reorientating at the moment and deciding where they will go but like that's a d that's a dup this is a tactic rather than strategy okay so we talked about the what we've learned about local politics which seems to be uh, negative so let's go to uh, let's go to uh, some positives what politician i'll still start with you what politician stood out for you in a positive way in 2022 that ends the year in a more enhanced way than they started. Well, I think we already discussed it. Michelle O'Neill played a blinder, and she did all year. And we could see that for the first time, the opinion polls put her above Naomi Long in terms of leader popularity. And the only thing that had changed between that poll and the previous poll was the death of the Queen and the handling 
of that. And I do think, you know, that you can see Sinn Féin have matured in terms of the fact that they're trying and they vision themselves as someone who's going to be in power north and south. And so they've, I think it, we know the first visit of the Queen they refused to participate in. I think they really, really, in the end, realised that that was a mistake, that they should have, and that sort of outreach between the Queen and Martin McGuinness and building on that. And, you know, the Michelle O'Neill herself, I have seen really come into her own since she became leader at the start. You could see that she was nervous, but yet I have attended events recently where she spoke, you know, for 10 minutes without a single sheet of paper in front of her with no notes, very confident. She's definitely grown in confidence in terms of her leadership. But the meeting with King Charles, and because obviously camera, you know, microphones are so sensitive now, we didn't used to hear those conversations when people met each other. But that was the thing that was really interesting about that visit because you could see him complaining about the pain and you could hear him having what exactly what he said to Michelle O'Neill and Jeffrey Donaldson. And one of the things that struck me and it spoke obviously, I am a city girl, but people here I'm friends with here from the country. She held him, held his hand with both hands, which is a very country wake type thing. It's clearly not protocol. It's not what you're meant to do when you're the king. But he responded really well to her. And you could see there was a genuine affection and warmth there. And it was almost like the DUP was a support and act. And that was just very bizarre. And I know that, you know, Sam McBride said recently that he had a call from a senior unionist. He said, we were once, you know, condemned mm -hmm. them because of their attitude against the royal family. Now they're too friendly with them. It was almost as if, you know, they were the, the people who yeah. the, the royal family came to, to meet. And that was the first time as first minister designate that that was, as we know, the only difference between those roles. You greet visiting dignitaries first. Yeah. Um, and so she got to, to greet King Charles first. And it definitely has played out well. And also the run up to that election in May, the DUP, obviously, there was, they had walked out of the executive. There was an own goal there that they could have continually negatively attacked them. But there's a realisation that Sinn Féin don't take votes off the DUP. And mm -hmm. attacking them for the sake of attacking them maybe wasn't playing out well with their voters and also those middle ground voters that they're trying to attract as well. And so it was very positive. All the social media, you know, the selfies with the kids, Michelle in the gym, it was all kept very positive and light and people definitely responded to that in a very big way. So I think you'll see more of that in the future. So rather than come out and attack people, it's that, no, let's talk about what we're doing and also let's be positive and do show us a positive Do you think face. just interesting, because one thing significant about the Sinn Féin campaign in the North this time was they downplayed a border poll. They downplayed, you know, I mean, I think we're all kind of waiting when Michelle Meal made those comments at that business lunch. Oh, there'll be an inevitable walk back here. Maybe she just went a couple of late, but they didn't. It was obviously, do you think we'll maybe see that to, to no, I don't even think it's at the drink because obviously they, they've sort of they've farmed that out to the Ireland's Future sort of campaign and they're dealing with that. But what we do know, and we know it from the census and we know from everything else that's happened recently, is that it's not Sinn Féin voters who will decide in the border poll because we already know what way they're going to vote anyway. You know, it's that it's that middle ground, and to reach out to that middle ground, mm -hmm. you have to change your tactics completely. And so you can see a sort of softening in terms of their outreach and how they speak speak and also you know the engagement of the royal family not, not only did she you know greet king charles he attended the queen's funeral and you know i was sitting watching it on tv and when they started playing god save the queen i thought my goodness like michelle o'neill um you know the champagne members sitting in the middle of that cathedral at the queen's funeral could you imagine 10, or 5, 10 15 years 20 years ago something like that happened and it just wouldn't so I do think that it has been a really, and you, because it's worked so well, they'll just continue to replicate that because it's clearly um, resonating with voters and voters who maybe weren't traditionally Sinn Féin voters originally. Okay. Brendan, what for you? Well, I do think it biggest is... Biggest winner of the year, sorry. Well, I do think it is hard to look past Michelle O'Neill, really, um, you know, as the biggest winner, I suppose, of the year, um, because even before, you know, the stuff that Alison's spoken about in relation to the Queen's death, you know, in the run up to the Assembly election, I think there has been a total transformation of Michelle O'Neill's image to the wider public. You know, if you only look back a couple of years and um, before that, we had the Bobby Story funeral controversy and Michelle O'Neill, I suppose, was right at the heart of that when there was a lot of scrutiny about whether she had, I suppose, apologised for what happened in relation to that during the COVID-19 pandemic and I suppose there was a lot of criticism over um, her role in that but then fast forward to this year and in the run-up to that assembly election we saw that total transformation in her image and a lot of it I think was down to how Sinn Féin mm -hmm. managed her social media profile so while you know we as reporters and as journalists are getting I suppose the usual statements that you get from different parties and they're saying different things on different topics you know there, there has been this um, concerted effort in terms of 
for example, her Instagram account, her Twitter account, her Facebook account to put across a uh, much more, I suppose, an image that um, people can warm to a lot more, um, you know, showing a more personable side to Michelle Neal, as well as showing someone who is this um, image that Sinn Féin's trying to put across of a first minister for all is, is the, I suppose, the tagline in that election. And so therefore, there was a lot more imagery of Michelle Neal going out and meeting people from different backgrounds and different communities and being that state person like um, figure that you know we hadn't seen previously and I find it amazing actually just it, subsequent to the election really that Michelle Neal has continued on mm -hmm. in that role and we're continuing to see her do those things and do that outreach and uh, by contrast we're not seeing any of that from Jeffrey Donaldson so while Sinn Féin has clearly seen that this positive campaign that they ran during the assembly election paid dividends and they're continuing that on even though there isn't technically an election campaign going on right now you know we're not seeing that from the other side from the DUP so I, I think that clearly you know Sinn Féin's on to a winner in relation to this and I think that uh, Michelle O'Neill has played it very well in terms of being able to turn around an image that a number of years ago didn't look as as favourable but um, clearly she's ending um, 2022 on a high. Yeah and even at the start of this year she didn't really have that image and she certainly ended in the year with it. John, what about for you? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd echo that sentiment and that analysis, but I, I'm going to go for, I, I suppose it, it's not the, 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 the politician that's most impressed me, but the one that's stood out and it's maybe a very uncharacteristic choice, and that's Doug Beatty. Uh, do you know, simply because I suppose uh, Doug is, is almost from another time, as we saw in the whole Tweetgate thing, you know, we saw that. But at the same time, he's someone who's, very sincere in what he's trying to do and you know and, and it's it's obvious where unionism sweet spot is and Doug has found it but he's having issues you know or having problems in trying to attract votes you know on the basis of that you know he knows that, uh, that unionism is naturally inclined you know not that, that will not say political unionism but unionism is liberal and you know has believes in in, in, in women's reproductive rights and things like this and, and same-sex marriage but it's always been dogged by this conservatism but uh, I think Doug then has has uh, he was written off weeks before the election due to, to Tweetgate and although he didn't really there wasn't much of a beaty bounce he at least survived that but you know going forward he's uh, you know if another election comes in the new year then he's uh, fighting for his political life. You know I don't think that Doug Beatty really has recovered from Tweetgate it feels like a lot of the spirit that he had for example even last year at his party conference and this whole union of people mantra that um, the UUP was putting out I don't I don't think really that same um, enthusiasm and that um, you know passion seems to come across I think in terms of the things that we've seen from D Doug Beatty since then and really for the UUP just generally they really don't seem to know which way to turn yes they are trying to be a more liberal unionist voice in in comparison to the DUP and the TUV but in terms of the protocol the big issue we still don't exactly know where the Ulster unionists stand in this and it's clearly if we're looking at the polls it's clearly um, causing them problems and will continue well, to do so people song again which is now <laughs> going to be in my head just the next week I just forgot that it existed they did win the sluggers uh, uh, PEB award of the assembly, which the Alison was, was a when we, were, when we were talking about that during the, the when uh, in the run up to that election, the question was: Is there a moderate unionist vote that either hasn't had anyone to vote for for a long time, and you need to attract them out of the house, or you know that was voting the DUP just because it was a unionist party, and can the UUP attract them back? And what we found out in that election is yes, there very much is a moderate unionist vote, but they all vote for the Alliance Party now, and that's it. So he. he missed the boat. It had, the UP wanted to turn themselves into that modern unionist party they needed to do it 10 years ago when the Alliance party started growing so that they could have took those votes. They just left it too late. Yeah, and that, that, it's interesting actually a senior UUP here actually said that to me about six weeks ago at very, the very same point. Uh, we've kind of touched upon it but we'll, we'll, we'll just go, go, go head, head on into it. Biggest losers of 2022. I'll start off with you on this, John. Who do you think the biggest lose, the biggest political? That could be a party or a politician. Biggest losers. It has to be the Greens, on, you know, in a, on a regional level, uh, without a doubt. You know, we're in the midst of a climate crisis, and we've lost the two, uh, the two greatest cheerleaders in the assembly for uh, environmental. They set so much. They're just interesting. Yet they set so much of the a, a political agenda 
at the start of the, their PMBs, like on climate change, uh, Alison has referenced a couple of the others. They, 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 what, what, what happened? Well, you've got to applaud Alliance for cannibalising them. That's, you know, that's ultimately what has happened. And, and you, you know, it, they, they maybe didn't win the ground war. That's, that's the issue and maybe took too much for granted. But really, I, I, it doesn't augur well for green politics. Uh, and, you know, if anywhere needs them, it's Northern Ireland. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I think too they're victim of their own success because those green policies everyone's adopted them now, so they're in everyone's manifesto now, and therefore that was their point of difference, wasn't it? I think, mm-hmm. I mean, I think in terms of of obviously the big loser of that election, it was Jim Allister because the polls were telling me he was getting you know five people elected with him. Sometimes we said there was going to be seven um, TUV people elected. I mean, it looked like he was bringing people back to the benches with him and he ended up, despite the fact he had like 60,000 votes, only being on his own. And the reason was because they're just not transfer friendly right. because nobody likes them. So you can get all the first preferences you want, but nobody... So we could see when you were looking, I mean, we were at the counts and you're looking at them coming in and they're going well over half a quota and you're going like anyone else would be elected on that. But that's where it stopped. It never went any further mm-hmm. than that because they just can't get the transfers because that is it. So, you know, I think that... In terms of that, there's maybe a realisation now that he has realised that this is it, yeah. you know, that he is always just going to be this one-man band. And in terms of, did he really want to bring anybody else with him? Because some of his candidates are a bit ropey. Like, I don't know if you'd have put them in the public eye, would they have survived the scrutiny of a Mark Crothers, of a David McCann? <laughs> would they? <laughs> well, would I don't they? Think <laughs> I, leave, I, leave, I leave that to, to, to you guys. Although there, there was a an election analyst out there questioning whether Jim would bring anyone else in, but uh, modesty forbids uh, mentioning <laughs> who, that, who that was. Uh, Brendan, biggest losers of... 20, I need to come up with a better term, but big, biggest political losers of 2022. Well, I, I have to mention Doug Beattie again, just briefly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, know, I know we've already you know, hammered home that he doesn't seem to be doing well this year, but you know, whenever you had the opportunity to suppose in, in that um, more recent assembly recall to try and hammer home that it's the DUP. It's this other unionist party that is causing the executive not to be up and running during a cost of living crisis and for Doug Beattie to make a hames of that with his comments about whining like a girl and then causing that you know sexism controversy around that and then he went and doubled down and he felt he, he said he was apologizing but then he said I'm man enough to apologize and just like Doug please just stop so you know things like that really means that you know I think that you know the UUP really needs to go away and you know really I suppose for their communications team you know you you see, for example, on the Sinn Féin side or even Alliance or any of the other parties, you know, their speeches are very um, carefully defined, they're well honed, you know, they're um, treated um, carefully as to what is said and what isn't said. And it seems that, you know, in, a, in an event like that, that the UUP ones are just able to rock up and no one's checking to see what they're going to say. So, you know, those sorts of things need to be clamped down on moving into 2023 for the Ulster Unions. Call me, sort of breathing the sigh of relief that you made through that side segment unscathed. Um, I'll start with you on this, John. Party that were the biggest winners, I suspect we're probably going to link back to, to round about say, but as a party, though, what, what party do you think had a really thumping year in 2020? Oh, well, it has to be Sinn Féin. And, you know, and for, we, we spoke about the, the, the refinement of, of Michelle O'Neill's image, but there wasn't much else to their campaign beyond that. You know, they just, they sat back and they let the DUP do all their campaigning for them, you know, and that's proving a successful formula. And I think they will just continue with that for now. You know, and the DUP are sort of lost as well. And, you know, in terms of campaigning for the union, they're, they're just pitching everything as culture wars these days, harking back to the troubles, you know, and really there's, there's uh, limited returns in that. Okay. Um, I thought the interesting thing about the Sinn Féin campaign was the presence of John Finucane in there as well. I thought the fact that someone who is an MP and wasn't even on the ballot anywhere being in there. Um, I'm going to disagree with John slightly. I think the DUP survived after the year they had had before. They had their own Liz Truss moment the previous year, going through three leaders in the space of three months. And the fact that they came back, they held all but two of their seats, I thought was a win for Jeffrey Donaldson. And the fact that they hold 25 assembly seats today, I thought, and compared to some of the polls yeah. that they had as well, where, where it was not looking pretty. Um, uh, and it's amazing how the Tories have kind of mapped uh, the DUP this, uh, uh, this cycle. 
What about uh, big winners for, for you, party we're talking about now? Well, I suppose from party ways, you have to show that that alliance bounce, even though people keep saying that, said it's flattered, it didn't, you know, and, and when you looked at the, the picture of the alliance party team in the last election and in this election, you see how much it's grown, and also in terms of diversity and young women and all of that there, but I mean, it really was Sinn Féin's election. We had just come out of the centenary. It is, you know, we're just past the 100 year anniversary, the formation of this state, which was created very specifically and it gerrymandered in a very specific way to hold a unionist majority. I'm pretty sure that the people who designed that border at that time expected that to last a lot longer than 100 mm. years. And yet, for the first time, you know, we have a Sinn Féin first minister returned and it was, as John said, it was the art of war. Never interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. They just sat back. They had really positive social media and they let, you know, the DUP do their own thing um, rather than continue to continually attack them and, and that really worked for them. And, you know, will they be able to replicate that in the South? Will they be able to replicate that campaign going forward? And then will they just continue to grow? Because obviously if we have Sinn Féin at the head of government in the North and the South, that's only going to increase the chances of there being a border poll at some time probably in the next five years and that's obviously their aim but they seem to be almost doing it by stealth now yeah. rather than doing it in like a really overt way yeah they just seem to be on a roll across yeah. the island um uh what about for you biggest winner well yeah i think everyone's mentioned Sinn Féin i think that's the obvious one i would have to agree with yourself in relation to the dup i do think that you know obviously a lot of criticism has come over their decision to uh, withdraw from the executive and to hold down power sharing over the protocol but that strategy seems to have been working for them throughout this year, you know, because obviously there was, you know, concern going into that assembly election that there was going to be total meltdown of the of the DUP, that they would lose seats to the TUV, Jim Alster's TUV. That didn't happen. And since then, really, they have managed to claw back a lot of that support, it seems, from what we see in the polling anyway. A lot of that support that had migrated to Jim Alister's um, party previously. So, you know, that strategy does seem to be working. Obviously, they do seem to be pushing themselves really into a corner. So at yeah. some point, they're going to have to, you know, get themselves out of that corner in some way. And, you know, I suppose we will hope to see in 2023 that they will, you know, decide what way they're going to go in relation to whatever the deal is on the protocol. But And that's the thing. You have your look at Twitter, non-DUP voters love telling DUP voters what to think or what to feel. And this is, you know, but yeah, when we do a poll, you can see that they're continuing to go up even now, even in the middle of a cost of living crisis. So it is popular with their base. But as you said, the, the, you know, the compromise is coming. It's yeah. coming soon. And he's got to have, Jeff Donaldson has well, to make a compromise. And then how does he tell those people who marched in those protocol parades, in those protests, that it's coming? Well, this leads me on to last question. Um, what to look out for in 2023? John, kick us off here. Well, obviously hard, to, given how unpredictable, I was about to say the last two years, but we're going back to 2016 here. Uh, every year since it's had a real political surprise. So what, what do you think we should be looking out for? Well, I think thinking? things are going to get worse before they get better. You know, I think we're looking at uh, a wave of industrial action in the new year. Um, and now I'm old, just old enough to remember the previous winter of discontent 78 into 79 and uh, subsequent to that you know there was a paradigm shift in our politics possibly for the worse you might say with Thatcherism but I'm cautiously optimistic that we may see a paradigm shift out of this winter because we really you know people have had enough and I'm talking about you know politics in England primarily and that there will be a knock-on effect into Northern Ireland as well because uh, I don't think we can continue to go on with the current state of things you know. Okay brilliant, Alison. Were either of you two born during the first winter of discontent? I'm pretty no, sure no. It was, it no, it was nine years before I was yeah, born. Yeah it was about a hundred years before Brad was born wasn't it? <laughs> That's just really no. Well I think it's really interesting because April is this massive anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement and yet it's a shambles. Um, and it was what, like that for the 20th. Though. It was. Do you remember? We were all there. We attended all those events and it was meant to be, you know, celebrating the, the wedding anniversary when the, you know, the, the couple were getting divorced. Um, <laughs> and it's going to be something very similar to that. And is Biden coming? Is that going to make a difference? Because he doesn't, I, you know, he doesn't have the sway that like a Clinton who can sweep it in during those crises in the past because unionism just don't trust, trust Biden. Um, his pride at his Irish heritage, you just put them off and day one. Um, would he be able to do anything? So I think, you know, I look forward to it because I like those big anniversaries because I like writing about them. I like looking back and I like following the trajectory of what's happened. But, I, you know, 
we had a big massive renegotiation at St Andrews. I do think that one's coming down the line. You know, mm -hmm. the, the sort of lurching from one crisis to another, the, for, the current form of government, you know, with one party being able to bring it all down, it's completely unsustainable and eventually there will have to be another renegotiation. Where there's no appetite for that at present, I do think that it, it's, it's definitely, you know, in our future. Okay. Brendan. Well, I think you'd be pleased to think, David, that there are really the question is how many elections will there be next year? We know that there's going to be the local government elections but in But we don't May. know the date yet. We don't know the specific <laughs> date, I was going to say as well, yes. But then obviously, will there be an assembly election tacked on to that? And then, of course, you know, we don't know whether there's going to be another meltdown in the Conservative Party that may trigger a, a general election on top of that. So we, we could have three elections in the one year you'll be pleased to know so uh, my heart just <laughs> my heart just teasing him so I think I think that is the main thing uh, for Northern Ireland there is obviously a lot of focus on this um, anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement and indeed whether Joe Biden is going to make the trip up north he may visit the the south of Ireland but whether he'll actually come to Northern Ireland as well I think that'll be the question as to whether or not there is an executive in place so, you know, I suppose the main thing for us in Northern Ireland is really, are we going to have Power Sherry back up and running uh, by this time next year? Or are we going to be, once again, a, a here at Slugger TV trying to work out what's going to happen uh, with no executive in place? Well, sure, no better company to do that with. Um, guys, thank you very much for giving a, a review of a very jam-packed uh, political year with lots of resignations, reshuffles and changes in uh, government. And this just leaves me to say thank you for watching. Uh, from all of us at Slug Roto, we wish you a very Merry Christmas. Uh, I want to thank my panellists, Alison Morse, John Manley and Brendan Hughes. You can keep up to date with everything else in the meantime on sluggerotool.com. Thank you for watching. <laughs>